Hello everyone and welcome back to the Color Spotlight series. In today's video that concludes the original eight episode run of this reboot, we are going to be taking a look at a very intriguing and new to me pigment, PY129. Oh no, last episode you say, well don't fret, I have more information at the end of this video about two more episodes that are coming your way and even a bonus secret episode that is available as well. But first, let's go ahead and talk about the color at hand, green gold. PY129's chemical name is azomethine copper complex, azomethine co copper complex, something like that. And it's actually a close cousin of the pigment that we discussed in our last episode, PY150, which is nickel azomethine yellow. Handprint rates PY129 as light fast, semi-transparent, and staining, but manufacturers like Winsor Newton, Daniel Smith, and M. Graham all kind of disagree in various ways. Winsor Newton considers their paint to be transparent, while M. Graham calls their light fastness excellent, and Daniel Smith claims that their version is low staining, the latter of which I don't really find to be accurate, but we'll talk about that when we get there. Regardless of those differences, this color is non-granulating and moderately valued. It is a dull greenish yellow color in its mass tone, lightening to a very cool yellow in the tints. I have very few samples of this color as it's not currently one that I have on my main palette. I always thought it was a really unpleasant color on its own, so I admit that I never really gave it much of a shot at mixing, although I have heard and have seen it be quite a valuable mixing color for a lot of artists. The first sample I have here is from Daniel Smith, and it was sent to me very early on in this channel's history by longtime patron Victor. They call their version of PY129 rich green gold, and it's probably the mellowest of the three samples that I have. It doesn't gain a ton of strength when it's layered, but due to that quality of it being lighter, it also doesn't seem as brown in its mass tone as others. Core's green gold comes in their high chroma set, and that's how I got my little tube of it. It's the only one that I have in a tube versus the other samples that were sent to me uh, in small quantities, but I still can't say that I've used it much before now. Like their other colors, this core color is a bit wild and likes to flow with lots of water, but that's very typical of core colors. One of our viewers, Melissa, just sent me our final sample that we're going to be looking at today from M. Graham specifically for this video. So thank you so much, Melissa, for that. This version is called Azo Green, and it is a long time favorite of Steve Mitchell from the Mind of Watercolor. True to M. Graham, this version has quite a punch, tons of pigment, although it doesn't glaze quite as cleanly as the core sample. Because I have so few swatches to show you of the color itself, I pulled a few other colors to show you in hopes of clearing up some confusion regarding the name of this color with other brands. Mission Gold calls their PY150 green gold, even though this is the same nickel azo yellow that we looked at in the last color spotlight video. Schminka has a color called Transparent Green Gold, which is made from two completely unrelated pigments, PY154 and PBR7, to form a very similar, but also very pale hue. From the research that I was able to do, Holbein has an interesting story with their version of this color. They previously used PY117 for their greenish yellow, is what they call it, which has the same chemical name as PY129. However, Handprint's light fastness test revealed that it was an impermanent color, fading quite drastically throughout his test. They now make a more permanent version, but use three pigments to do so. PY150 as the base color, given the similarities between it and PY129. PG7, which I imagine they used to give it a bit of a greenish cast, and PBR25, most likely to dull down that bright green since it is a red-brown color. However, with other signal pigments available on the market that are almost exactly the same color, I'm not sure why you want to go with this three pigment blend unless there's a substantial financial advantage in the area that you specifically live in. Finally, we have Daniel Smith's green gold as opposed to their rich green gold, which is their PY129 that we're looking at today. And this is another three color blend, but this one is incredibly different in hue from the other samples we've been looking at. This is a lovely light green color that is beautiful in its own right, but it's got the name that all these other versions of green gold have. And since I've heard so much confusion over the name differentiation, I wanted to go ahead and mention it here. 
Now we are moving on to our color mixing. As always, if you'd like to see a more complete tutorial on how I mix these types of varying swatches, I'll link the tutorial in a card in the upper right hand corner for you. Today is a bit of a treat because of the fact that this color is not and has never been on my main palette, which means it has never been in a color spotlight episode. So all the combinations that we're going to be looking at today are fresh mixes. When I was doing my preliminary testing to see what colors I wanted to show off, since this color is so new to me, I went through the gamut. I mixed it with every color that I could. And what I found, at least for me, is that this color is strongest when mixing browns and greens. So that is what I'm going to show you today. Today we're going to be using Daniel Smith's version of PY129 for all of our mixes, and first up we have it mixed with M. Graham's Quinacridone Rose. The result is a range of muted rusty oranges that merge into soft coral pinks, and I really really liked this combination, and it's not one that I would think to put together. The second mixture gets a little bit more earthy as we mix this color with Perylene Maroon. The colors that we see here range from ochres to burnt sienna like hues that when watered down into tints make for a lovely range of various skin colors. I debated on showing you a Venetian red here as well, but although it's more opaque than the Perylene Maroon, it has very similar hues, so instead we're going to go ahead and jump right on over to the greens. We're going to move from the light to the dark green, starting with M. Graham's Cobalt Teal. I just mentioned the brand here because of the fact that it's made with PB28 instead of PG50, in case you guys want to know that, but any Cobalt Teal should get similar hues. This combo provides some really lovely bright sap greens when it's closer to the green gold end of things, and as we move closer to Cobalt Teal, the color gets even more vibrant and resembles perhaps kind of a seafoam green color. Next up, I couldn't decide between Thalo Blue or Thalo Green, so I split the difference and used Thalo Turquoise. Again, we have some really bright sap greens that get to be more of an emerald or a Kelly Green the closer we get to this dark Thalo Turquoise. Our last two combos are gorgeous and similar to each other, so I could have picked one or the other, but I really couldn't decide between the two. Anthroquinone Blue mixed with the green gold, dare I say it, makes shades reminiscent of Daniel Smith's original sap green. Moving closer to the deep blue, we get a rich hooker's green and even some deep moody teals. Finally, we have Perling Green once again making appearance in the Color Spotlight series. The lighter end of the scale closer to the green gold is similar to the Anthroquinone Blue, as you can see here, but as we mix in more of the Perling Green, it gives us a warmer dark green shade since it lacks the blue undertone that we see above in the Anthroquinone Blue. To finish off the page, we're going to be doing our usual pigment demos. The first is a dispersion test going wet into wet. This Daniel Smith version of PY129 isn't much of a mover. Next is the glaze that I feel like does fine. It's not like amazing, but it's not bad either. And we're following that up with the lifting test. Now, many of the brands, as I mentioned before, cited that this was a staining color, but Daniel Smith specifically said that it is not. And this is Daniel Smith's version but I've got to agree with the mini here instead of my favorite brand because I did find this color to be quite staining. The paper actually pilled when I was trying to lift it, which actually hadn't happened in many of the other episodes, and just like Nickel Azo Yellow, this color gets everywhere while I'm painting and it is a bit of a pain to clean up after. This last one on the page is the softening off, so I put down wet paint on dry paper and then add water to try and soften off the edge to white. As we move into the demonstration painting, I wanted to go ahead and tell you why it is that I was inspired to make this piece. We first started off this series many months ago and established right out of the gate that we were going to be doing an all unicorn theme. I also believe that during that first episode in the comments we were talking about all unicorns versus mythical creatures, and someone commented on wanting to see a turtle or a tortoise made into a unicorn for the series, and I was immediately transported to one of my favorite children's books. First off, I just want to say that this is not some weird sponsorship in any way. I bought this book years ago with my own money when I had a short stint with a book company and immediately fell in love with its sweet message, so I wanted to go ahead and share it here with you guys today. 
Bob is a Unicorn by Michelle Nelson Schmidt is a very sweet story about Bob who imagines that he is a unicorn and asks all of his friends one by one if they would like to play with him. They all seem to be too busy with their own lives at the moment to humor him, which I'm sure we can all relate to at some point in our lives being on one side of that coin or the other. He nearly gives up when he comes across a fairy, at which time the illustrations change from a more graphic style to a youthful watercolor spread. And of course, this fairy can see that Bob is in fact a unicorn and offers to play with him. In the last pages of the book, we quietly see Bob the elephant riding off with a little girl in fairy wings, reminding us all to believe in ourselves, to believe in the power of imagination, and to accept each other for what makes us each unique. All of that being said, my favorite part of the book is actually on the hardcover edition, where underneath the dust jacket, you get to see Bob and all of his friends wearing either fairy wings or a unicorn, even a grumpy little tortoise, which brings us back to today's piece with a torticorn. Now I have to say that this piece also has another meaning for me, being the conservationalist that I am, and that is that I was deeply moved to create a piece sort of as a tribute or an honor of Lonesome George, a Pinta Island tortoise who passed away in 2012 as the last of his kind. The last of any species always reminds me of the story of the last unicorn, so I felt like there was this other natural connection to the piece that I wanted to create. The Pinta Island tortoise was from the Galapagos and has a story that's all too familiar for today's world. Humans bring new species all the time when they go to these protected and fragile island environments, and in this case, when a handful of goats were introduced in the 1950s and then became reinforced by other explorers and merchants also leaving goats on the islands, over time, these few goats grew into over 200 thousand goats that were ultimately destroying the natural food sources and the landscape that belonged to the tortoises and the other island animals of the Galapagos. Unfortunately, the devastation to these islands only ended after a massive wide-scale extermination in 1997 that led to destroying over those 200,000 goats in order to help protect the islands, both atrocities of which were completely preventable if humans didn't think that they knew better than nature and minded their own business about invasive species. The goats have since been removed from the main island and the majority of the other islands, but George and his species are a very real reminder that our actions have consequences, and for me, they remind me to try and do better for our planet every chance I get. Anyway, I know that was a bit heavy for a non-AAC piece here on the channel, but I thank you for hearing George's story. And coming back to Bob, sweet Bob the Unicorn, who reminds us all to do right by each other, a friend of mine still works for the book company that publishes this story, so I asked her for her link to add to the description below this video. It works similarly to how my affiliate links work, although the sales won't benefit me, but they will help out another kind small business owner. So if the story of Bob the Unicorn spoke to you, and you'd like to pick up your own copy, feel free to use that link if you'd like, and we both thank you in advance. Before I go, I did promise you a color spotlight update. This is the conclusion of the eight episodes that I initially promised you guys, but our amazing patrons have unlocked two additional episodes. Be sure to thank them in the comments below for that. I chose some of the most asked for pigments and had them vote on them to see which two colors would be included in these episodes, and the overwhelming majority went to none other than Perling Green. We'll round out the reboot with Venetian Red, which will be the first fully opaque color that we will have taken a look at in the entire history of the series. But that's actually still not everything because that second seed spot was a highly contested position in the series. Both Venetian Red and Cerulean Blue were battling it out and tied not only for the first round, but also in the tiebreaker round. So in order not to break the hearts of any of my patrons who voted for Cerulean, we did something a little bit special this time around over on Patreon. Our live stream this month was a behind the scenes look at how I create the swatch pages for the Color Spotlight series Z series <laughs> and using cerulean blue. Then for one of our $5 tier tutorials, I used cerulean blue to paint an elephant so that together between the live stream and the tutorial, they'd kind of be like a real-time version of the Color Spotlight series. Admittedly, these were not as researched or as elegantly spoken as I tried to appear in these videos, but if that is something that you guys are interested in, you can go ahead and check them out over on Patreon. 
I want to thank all of you guys for your support throughout the season, and of course, a huge thanks to my patrons for supporting this channel and keeping this show going even further. I will see you guys all on Monday with a special announcement video, and until then, happy painting!